Okay, so my friend sent this to me one day. A diagram that looks like a giant convoluted math lasagna. I would have brushed it away, but then I saw it was being blatantly classist. Calling numbers perfect? Weird? Not under my watch. It's time to tell people about the number bullying that goes on in the shadows. And yes, we'll get to the title of the Riemann hypothesis, I am not clickbaiting you. So, these terms like abundant and deficient and their descent into madness have to do with divisors of a number. Any number that divides another number is called a factor or a divisor of that number. So, the number 30 has divisors 1, 2, 3, 5, 6, 10, 15, and 30 itself. Numbers whose divisors are only 1 and the number itself are called prime numbers. And the numbers which are not prime are called composite, and that's on the diagram. So hey, we are already making progress. Before we get any deeper, we need to define two important functions. First one is the function s, which takes in a natural number and spits out the sum of its proper divisors, which are all the divisors that are strictly smaller than the number. So if we shove in 12 into the function, let's see what the output s of 12 will be. Clearly, 1 divides 12 as it divides everything, 2 divides 12 as 12 is even, and the other divisors of 12 are 3, 4, 6, and 12. For s of 12, we ignore the number itself and add all the others up, giving us a total of 14. You can think of s as standing for the word sum. This is also called the aliquot sum of n, which is a really nice pretentious word, so we will be using this throughout the video. Another function is sigma of n. Sigma is the Greek s, and sigma of any natural number is the sum of all the divisors. So this time we are including the number itself. So sigma of n is the previous quantity, the aliquot sum of n, plus n. So you might have noticed something in this diagram. No, not the fly. What? Where did that come from? Ugh, anyway, so you might have noticed the word abundant, of course. Detour. So words that describe themselves are called autological. The typical example is polysyllabic, which is a polysyllabic word. Normally the word abundant does not describe itself, but in this context it does because it's abundantly present in the diagram. So it's autological in this particular context. Autological words are also called homological words. Homological algebra is a field of mathematics which arose from the study of homology. Homology is the study of holes in a geometric object and this was pioneered by Riemann of the Riemann hypothesis. So, there's your connection to the Riemann hypothesis. An abundant number is the one where the aliquot sum is strictly larger than the number itself. So, as my advisor would say, let's do an example. Let us compute the aliquot sum for 18. The divisors for 18 are 1, 2, 3, 6, 9, huh, nice, and 18. Remove the last one and add the rest to get the sum 21, which is larger than 18. So, our boy 18 is abundant. This definition is basically the same as saying that sigma of a natural number n is strictly larger than twice the number. So yay, we have the orange part now. Very similarly, a number whose aliquot sum is strictly smaller than the number is called deficient. Let us pick 26, whose proper divisors are 1 and 13, which add up to 14. So 26 is deficient. Fun fact, primes are deficient, so let's put that on the diagram. Also, we define a primitive abundant number to be such that each of its divisors, except maybe the number itself, are deficient numbers. So 70 is primitive abundant because 1, 2, 5, 7, 10, 40, and 35, all the proper divisors of 70 are all deficient numbers. So what happens at the sweet, sweet spot where the aliquot sum matches the number? If you haven't seen them before, let me have the honor of introducing you to perfect numbers. They are so divine and mysterious that we really don't know a lot about them. We don't even know if there are infinitely many of them. And all the perfect numbers we know are even. There's nothing stopping them from being odd, but they all just happen to be even. Any odd perfect number that we may find should be larger than this monstrosity, by the way. Okay. Now we can get to the crazy parts of the diagram. So let's make a plot where we put n on the x-axis and sigma n on the y-axis. As we go from left to right, we keep a track of the line which marks the maximum value we have until now. We will call this the ceiling. So every time we cross this ceiling, we push it up to a new height. This is what it looks like.
the number n for which we push the ceiling up is called a highly abundant number. So we can see that 18 is highly abundant, so is 20 and so is 24. In notation, a number n is highly abundant if sigma of n is greater than sigma of k for all k smaller than n. Awesome, we got a pretty decent part of the diagram down. And sorry I lied to you, we need another function, which we'll denote by d of n. It counts the number of devices of a number. So like 12 has devices 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, and 12. And so d of 12 is 6. A highly composite number is like a highly abundant number, but instead of looking at sigma of n, we look at d of n. So a number is highly composite if it has more divisors than any number smaller than it. This is what it looks like on a graph. Now, a super abundant number is a number for which sigma of n over n is larger than sigma of k over k for any k which is smaller than n. In this case, we plot n on the x-axis and sigma of n over n on the y-axis and see whenever the ceiling shifts. Fun fact, all superabundant numbers are also highly abundant. The value of this quantity sigma of n over n tells you if the number is abundant, deficient, or perfect. This quantity is intuitively a measure of how many divisors a number has, normalized by its size. Just due to the virtue of its size, a large number could have a lot of factors, and so we are accounting for that by the normalization. As much as this diagram would like to convince you that these two notions of superabundance and highly compositeness are the same, let me tell you, they're not. Only finitely many of them are in both the categories. Okay, so now we're at the very end. Let's talk about these two mouthfuls of terms with- Hey, listen up. What? Who is that? Down here. What? Who is this? On the bottom left, can you like bat a little down? Oh, Osemite, hey. Hey, what's up? You did not cover me. I talked about you, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just gonna get to you. Don't, don't worry. Dude, you just said it's the end. Yeah, yeah, no. I, I was just saying that, you know, for the narrative flow, for the content. You forgot about me, didn't you? No, man, it's not like that. You just ignored me. Did you do that because... Oh, don't say it. No, 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 you literally don't say cut it. me out. Please and don't I know say why. it. Tell me, is it because I'm weird? Oh my god, fine, let's do this. A number is called weird, no offense, None taken. if the sum of the divisors is larger than the number itself. So, s of n is strictly greater than n, but also with the added condition that you cannot sum any lesser number of divisors to make the number itself. So what does this all mean? For example, 20 is not weird because even though the aliquot sum of 20 is 22, we can pick out just 1, 4, 5 and 10 and drop 2 from the divisors list to make the sum equal to 20. Why can't you be more like 20, man? Now on to superior highly composite numbers. To define these, you might be tempted to compare the quantity d of n over n and look at the ceiling shifting. But we will actually look at a more general function. First, let's pick a positive real number epsilon. We say that a number n is epsilon composite if d of n over n to the epsilon is greater than or equal to d of k over k to the epsilon for all k smaller than n. We also define this for k bigger than n, and in that case, we make this inequality strict. So, now we are not looking at the ceiling like before, but actually at a peak in the graph. For a given epsilon, say 0.4, we plot d of n over n to the power 0.4, and we see that 120 peaks out. So, this means 120 is the epsilon composite number for epsilon equals 0.4. We now call a number superior highly composite, if it's epsilon composite for any epsilon. So, as we saw before, 120 is 0.4 composite, so it lies in the set. Similarly, 12 is 0.5 composite, so it's also in this set. This naming convention is nice because all superior highly composite numbers are also highly composite. So, our number n is called colossally abundant if sigma of n over n to the epsilon is greater than sigma of k over k to the epsilon for all natural numbers k at least 2. This is very similar to the one before, but with the caveat that epsilon in this case is strictly greater than 1. Notice how this is a generalization of superabundant numbers, where epsilon was set to exactly 1, 
And in that case, we compared the value with k smaller than n, but in this case, we compare values for all k. To quote John Daniel in the seed song, I know you have been waiting for the punchline. Assuming the Riemann hypothesis to be true, Ramanujan ensured that the following inequality will hold for all numbers greater than 5040, which is a colossally abundant number. If any other number has to violate this inequality, then it must have a lot of divisors. It has been shown that a number that violates this inequality must be super abundant, and there should be at least one colossally abundant number that also violates this. So, if we just look through the list of colossally abundant numbers greater than 5040 and find one for which this inequality is false, then Riemann hypothesis will be disproved. Although this work was done 30 years ago, this trajectory has been mostly inactive due to its lack of promise in tackling the Riemann hypothesis. Primes are the building blocks of all numbers, and so understanding their distribution is important. This video by Quanta expands on how the Riemann hypothesis comes into picture in understanding that distribution. So it makes sense that looking at these special kinds of numbers with lots of factors would shine some light on this problem. And there it is. The connection of this discount mathematical Mondrian-esque diagram with one of the deepest and hardest problems in math. Hope this was fun. I have put some links and discussions in the description below if you're curious for more. Thanks for watching.